If you're on the lookout for a new monitor, large ultra-wide displays are flooding the market. And this one, showcasing an Amiga, has caught my eye. At around $200, 34 inches, and 144 Hz, I kind of fancy my chances. And checking out the specs, it seems to be the same unit as this monitor from MSI, but without branding and with more Amiga. But is it worth changing to an ultra-wide monitor? Let's find out. Welcome to Team Pandora. Subscribble. So this is what came from Amazon. A huge cardboard box. And inside this box, another box. But this time from HKC. For eSports. Carefully using a spoon to cut the sellotape, we can now get inside. We have a power lead, type I. This plugs into the included adapter. Here's a very thin manual. A display port cable. And this bit at the back is for a monitor stand. And here it is. As the whole thing is curved, it feels very different to a regular flat monitor. And we can rest it like this, as there's a tiny bezel that protects the display. The adapter runs at 19 volts, 2.58 amps, and can deliver 49 watts. And thankfully, we have the standardized socket, so you can use a power lead native to your own land. Here's the hammer-shaped stand, which tells you to be yourself. Feels pretty sturdy. It just clips in. So here's the odd power cable that we mentioned earlier, but there's no way I'm going to use a travel adapter with this. I'd rather use one of my own cables. And now for the last bit of the stand. This thing. I mean, there's no doubt it's sturdy, but it feels more like a weapon. To attach, we need to put in three screws with a posi driver. Let's have a look at the connections. We've got DC, audio, two HDMI 2 ports, and a display port. And over here, we have the Kensington lock. Kensington. Underneath the monitor, there are five switches and a line. This is a solid warning sign that the UI will be difficult to navigate. We can turn the display, tilt it up and down, and even raise or lower the whole thing. So far, this display looks quite nice indeed. Meow. We'll connect the monitor using the supplied DisplayPort cable. And as this display has no internal speakers, we'll need to use a set. Plugging these into the display's 3.5mm audio jack will allow us to hear any audio sent via the HDMI or display port. And the jump from a 16.9 to a 21.9 desktop is truly impressive. With it turned on, there is an RGB function, if that's your thing, and that can be altered in the menu. Just going to move this to a nice viewing position. There we go. While Windows is updating, let's have a look at the UI. As feared, it's extremely irritating to navigate. This one's in English and Chinese, and has a nice selection of features. However, none of these are explained at all in this menu. We have overdrive settings, crosshair, FreeSync Premium, HDR, motion blur removal, side-by-side -side screen, and picture-in-picture. -picture. Turning on HDR can level out the colors somewhat. As this display uses VA panel, it has typically larger levels of contrast than IPS. But how is it for desktop use? Well, with the extra real estate on both sides, it essentially gives us two displays in one, which is a great platform for multitasking. And even at ultra-wide 1440p, it doesn't feel like a step down from 4K. So what about gaming? While Steam in big screen mode looks amazing here, but even though these monitors are geared towards gaming, the transition is not exactly smooth. Unless the game developers have thought about and included a 21.9 mode, it may take some faffing to get working. And when they do work, you may be stuck with black borders on the left and the right of the screen. But who knows, we might be surprised. Let's check out some games. Streets Rage 4. There's no 21.9 settings, so we've got black borders on the left and the right. Shakedown Hawaii. While the screen looks amazing all filled up, we can see that ghosting is apparent when there is movement. Using the modern settings, we can lessen the effect, but we couldn't completely get rid of it. Tekken 7 is built specifically for a 69 arcade display, and even though the arcade system does use a computer, there are no settings in which we can fill a screen. But where displays like this do come into their own is for games built for the PC. Here's Dota 2, and using the full 21.9 aspect ratio, we can see far more than we could on a 16.9. And in racing games, the 21.9 in addition to the curved display really pulls you into the game, taking a big box for added immersion.
But what about the consoles? While hooking up the PlayStation 4, it does work, but we're limited to 1080p at a 16-9 aspect ratio, leading us with black borders to the left and right. And while we're limited to 60Hz, we can use the HDR feature. It's just a shame we can't use the whole screen. The side-by-side -side feature does not work while using two HDMI inputs, so you need to use one connected via the display port. So now I have two displays, one on the left and one on the right. But they both completely fill the screen with no thought to aspect ratio. And the same applies for the picture-in-picture -picture mode. While it does technically work, it is extremely half-baked. It's probably more useful for someone that uses two computers rather than a console. So it looks okay in 16.9 here. Pip mode on. Pip. And it's wide. And it's wide. Next up, the PlayStation 3. As it is an older system, we're limited to 1080p, but the games look and run fine. Once again, the curve adds to the immersion while playing racing games, and we're stuck with the bars at the left and the right. And we even tried with the driving simulator. Unfortunately, no extra screen options were available. What about the Xbox 360? Same thing. What a game. But how about the Mega Drive Mini 2? Or with a 720p output, it works fine. But how is this monitor when connected to the A Foundry Mini? Well, this too has a 720p display, and in the game carousel, it looks amazing. The games can scale to a 4 3 aspect. We can even use the 50Hz mode to get a smoother experience. But like earlier with Shakedown Hawaii, ghosting is apparent on this display. It's more noticeable with classic titles, but we're not going to let that stop us from having a little fun. But how about a real Amiga connected via RGB to HDMI? Well, Workbench looks amazing, but as we don't have a way to auto-crop, some games may not use the whole height of the screen. Ghosting is still there, but at least we can watch some Mighty Fine demos. I think it's about time for the pros and the cons. At $200, this 34-inch HKC monitor has great value. Even though its limit is ultra-wide 1440p using the DisplayPort, it has a nice range of features. For the cons, the UI is terrible. Ghosting is an issue, there's no internal speakers, and the lack of I.O. can rub some people the wrong way. Is it worth getting an ultra-wide 1440p over a regular 4K? Well, there are pros and cons either way. While 4K has a lot more detail, it needs to push more pixels, making it much heavier on your computer. Ultra-wide 1440p is ideal for video editing, without the need to increase the size of text. But as games use 16.9 predominantly, out of the box, most will run with black bars. There are a few websites that provide solutions in getting games working in 21.9, and their work is exceptional. But what's needed are game developers to start adopting ultra-wide as a standard. Both Ubisoft and Steamworks are doing well with many titles supported. But when Darius CS doesn't even have it as an option, other game devs need to push their way. Thanks, Valve. As we finish up with a bit of Outrun, here's a big thank you to all of those on our Patreon. Here at Team Pandori, we make video reviews like this, as well as guides, and help fix them cheap arcade boxes and the A500 Mini. If you appreciate our work, please consider joining, or a simple like and subscribe would do us a solid. This has been Amy Chicken of Team Pandori, and here are some of our other videos. Catch you at the McDonald's car park. I'll be waiting. I do like to scroll. Ta-ra. <laughs>